and dystonia, which is the one that I'm going to talk about primarily, um, excessive movement and unwanted postures. Now, again, in AHC, these things can start out as being intermittent, uh, uh, but over time they can become more progressive. And the, the specific disorders that you see during during the uh, uh, the episodes during the specific phases when kids are are down or they're or having worsening spasms, um, those may be very different than what you see at baseline. Um, there's obviously some overlap, but again, recognizing that this is what we call an acute on chronic set of symptoms. So there's acute symptoms and there's chronic symptoms which are progressing over time. So just to, again, put, just because the ataxia is, is something that I think may be a, a component of this, and I just wanted to show some videos just to put, again, the, the things that are not dystonia. Um, this, is, this is the, uh, the these are uh, two kids that some of you may know, both of whom uh, have diagnosis of AHC although there's a bit of a variant uh, in, in both kids. Um, but, the, uh, um, but again, I just want to show this example of ataxia where you see this sort of floppy movement, right? They're sort of a little bit unsteady. They can't quite compensate for movement. They reach the hand out and the trunk moves to one side. Um, they just kind of can't get their feet under them the way you'd expect. They're weaving a little bit as they walk, right? And that's, that's the ataxia. And, this, and, and one of the reasons I'm putting this up there is because in, in some ways, just and from, from seeing some of the kids here and from the kids I've seen in the past, this may be a, a extremely common feature of it, and when I talk later about where I think the dystonia is coming from, there's a possibility that the dystonia and the ataxia are actually coming from the same part of the brain, right? So that so this may actually be be important. Anyway, but on to dystonia. So what is dystonia? We came up with a definition for it, which isn't all that helpful. Um, um, Kathy Svoboda and I uh, and, and uh, uh, several other people, many of your neurologists were on a, uh, a task force to try to define these terms. Uh, the definition uh, had to be agreed upon by many different specialists and therefore is significantly watered down. Um, so a movement disorder in which involuntary, sustained, or intermittent muscle contractions cause twisting, repetitive movements, abnormal postures, or both. And I like to point out that if you remove the word involuntary and the word abnormal, that also describes normal movement. So it's not a particularly good definition. What I use is, is involuntary posture or movement triggered by voluntary movement. Um, so the idea is, and it's actually by voluntary movement or posture, like the attempt to do something gets twisted and, and sort of perverted, right? You try to make move one muscle and you get sick. You try to sit up and you get more going on. You try to uh, avoid some painful stimulus and your whole body twists up as a result of that, right? Um, you, try, you, have a, you try to compensate for some posture. You, you try, so anytime you're trying to do something, you get the excess muscle activations associated with that. That is sort of an overflow phenomenon. And that's, that's very common for dystonia. These are um, uh, children with variations on cerebral palsy. None of, none of these children ha has AHC. Um, and, and as you recognize, the, the, uh, the dystonia that they have does look a little bit different from what your, your children have. But again, it's the same co component where you see the child at the lower left has this fixed sort of posture of his right arm. He can't get out of that. Um, he can by relaxing, right? But as soon as he's just, the action of trying to sit up or trying to use his left hand makes the right arm get very stiff. Um, the girl at the upper right there has sort of the hyperkinetic components of dystonia and recognizing that dystonia can have both postures and can have excess movement associated with it, right? But again, it's always associated with attempts to do something. And the attempt to do something may be nothing more than just trying to sit up, right, or to stand, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't be that you have, you don't necessarily have to be moving that limb. Uh, you don't have to move your right arm to get dystonia in your right arm. Just sitting up might create the dystonia in your right arm. But usually the kids can relax. If you can get them to relax, the dystonia goes away. And again, in the HC, the situation would be much more if you can get, once the spasm stops, the dystonia goes away, as, as you'd imagine. So these things are uh, um, quite common. The uh, uh, child in the upper left has a, a very typical sort of backward head thrusting dystonia, which is uh, um, several of the people I spoke to this morning pointed out that that's a, a common feature of, of some of the AHC kids. Um, as I was mentioning at the beginning, dystonia is a symptom, it's not a disease. Um, this is important in, in looking at the literature because the literature in adults treats dystonia as if it's a disease. It's not. Um, it's caused by many, many different things. Um, and, and this means that potentially we can learn how to treat the symptom from other diseases. Right? So the information that we learn about dystonia as a symptom of cerebral palsy may be helpful to, in how we might treat dystonia as a symptom of AHC. We do tend to put these things in the categories. Um, the pat there's always, you want to think of it as, as there's levels of disability. Um, at the sort of the bottom level the, the, is, is that the pathophysiology, what caused it, in this case AHC. Then you have the impairment, which is dystonia. And then there are the things that dystonia makes difficult for you, right? Your task performance, daily living, societal participation. Of course, it is different depending on whether you have the dystonia every day or whether it's just occurring in, in episodes. 
Um, dystonia is an example of hypertonia, resistance to passive movement. That just means stiffness, right, basically. They're the two major forms of stiffness or spasticity in dystonia. Um, and, and the reason I'm pointing this out is just because people get confused about this. Um, uh, I, I suspect that, that many of your kids do have some spasticity. There's, uh, uh, that can show up as a spastic catch, and that's often seen in the lower extremities. So you'll often see that in the ankles or the knees with high reflexes and a spastic catch. This is what spasticity looks like. You get this sort of sudden catch and release phenomenon, right? That's spasticity. Very different from dystonia. Spasticity is something that I, as an examiner, elicit by pushing on children. Dystonia is something the child elicits themselves by attempting to move. Right? Um, you can, uh, uh, we, we can measure the movements. We can measure the EMG. We can see differences between these things. That, that's not necessarily the relevant issue. Um, actually, here, you know, I did lie. There is, uh, we do have sound here. Let's see if I can bring the sound up a little bit. What I'm trying to show here, that, that sort of noise in the background, that little sort of, it, it's like a hissing or a, a water, is, is, is the, that's the EMG, that's, that's the, the uh, uh, sound of the muscles themselves, and the point is that I am pushing this child with dystonia. That. But the, the point is that as I push him, his muscles are reacting to me. He's not trying to move. I'm pushing on him. So I push his arm here. Right? That means his muscles are reacting to me. That means it's a reflex. Right? What dystonia is doing is it's pushing against you. When kids get stiff, it's, it's the muscles are pushing back against you. They're not stiff because they're contracting their muscles. It looks like it. Right? It looks like they're just co-contracting all their muscles. But it's not that. Dystonia is actually quite smart. Um, it is trying to hold its postures. It is trying to hold the abnormal position. It's, it's outside the voluntary control of the child, but it's using some of the, what I would consider the relatively high level um, uh, uh, mechanisms for, for controlling movement. So for instance, this is an example of, of me uh, in holding a, the so child might put their arm in that device and I push the device back and forth and I'm moving their arm back and forth. As I move their arm back and forth, um, I look at what happens to the, the EMG, so to the muscle activity, the electrical activity in the muscles. And the electrical activity is, is shown uh, in, in those top two traces, and so the top one is the, is the biceps. And as I'm moving the child through the, this ar through the arm, uh, so uh, here, so do, you have a, do you have a laser pointer? I didn't bring it. So as I, uh, um, uh, as I move the child in, in uh, sort of back and forth through the joint, different joint angles, you see that there's muscle activity that kind of follows it, right? And, and this is, again, and, and this, this child that has dystonia and was stiff at, at the time, so as I'm trying to move them, they're stiff. And it's, it's just important to realize this, that, it's, that dystonia is, is that smart and it's a reflex. And it's important, the reason it's important to realize that it's a reflex phenomenon is because we think about spasticity as being a reflex phenomenon. But once you recognize that dystonia is also a reflex phenomenon, we have a lot of medicines that we can use to treat reflexes. And, and so we can use those to try to damp down the reflexes. Now, are there different reflexes? Spasticity comes from a reflex, that the, the stretch reflex that occurs at the spinal cord, right? When I tap on your knee and your knee goes out, that's because a signal goes up to your spinal cord and comes back down. Dystonia is probably going all the way up to your brain and coming back down, but it's still a reflex, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we, how we end up using that information to treat people. Now, as I said before, there's the hypertonic, the sort of the stiffness in dystonia, and then there's the hyperkinetic dystonia, and that's where you have sort of extra movements associated with it. Um, the, uh, uh, I show the picture of the mouse. It's an, this is a, uh, a knockout mouse that was uh, uh, created up at Stanford um, that also has a lot of dystonic effects. Right? When it relaxes, it doesn't have movements, and as soon as it starts to try to move, you get both the excess movement and the postures. The interesting thing about the mouse is that the abnormality there is entirely sensory. And so the point is to recognize that different parts of the brain can lead to dystonia. It's not even that different diseases lead to dystonia, but different parts of the brain can cause dystonia. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But the, the high, uh, the excess movement, the variability in dystonia, you can measure. So again, back in this device, but now I can clamp that device and I can just ask children to, uh, to try to maintain a constant force. Right? And there's lots of situations in which you might maintain a constant force, right? One of which is if I have to hold something up, right? I have to apply an upward force equal to the downward force of gravity, right? And that allows me to hold something fixed. If I can't match the downward force of gravity, my arm is going to move around a little bit, right? 
And so what's happening here is I'm not just asking kids to maintain a constant force along this black line. Healthy children about the same age will typically have, say, pretty close to the line the kid with dystonia is bouncing all around. And in fact, is a little bit under the line, demonstrating some weakness in some parts of this, right? And, and we see this typically. There's just a lot of variability, even at the single muscle level. If you ask people to do complex movements that involve multiple muscles, it's that much worse, right? So you get a lot of extra movement due to the variability. So again, there's two things about the dystonia, fixed postures, and variable movement, right? And they may be related to each other. It may be that the variability is because you're suddenly having little fixed inserted postures at various points. Um, the uh, um, dystonia is very characterized by overflow. This is if I have four, mu four different muscles on the hands here and I say activate this muscle, you get only that muscle. This one, you get only, you, you get each one, right? This is the muscle I asked you to activate. This is the muscle you actually activated. And what you should do is just get things down the diagonal here. So healthy controls, if I ask you to do this, you get that. I ask you to do this, you get that, right? In a dystonic subject, I ask you this, you get two muscles. Or here you get three or different patterns. So you get, that's overflow, right? So you, you try to activate one, th what I say is you activate one muscle, you get six. Uh, lots of extra things. That's what we call overflow, and that's one of the things that leads to the abnormalities. But what actually happens in terms of the movement? This child has a genetic disease called DYT1 dystonia. It's, it's a primary dystonia, um, and uh, it develops over time, and usually has onset when the kids are six or seven years old and, and will get worse. Um, uh, it's treatable, as I'll, I'll show you later. Um, but he has, there's a couple of things to notice about this, one of which, of course, is that he has very abnormal movements. But the other thing to notice is how successful he is at moving down the hallway. This child does not have dyspraxia, right? He has figured out how to compensate effectively for his movement disorder. It's very important to recognize that because in a lot of the cerebral palsy kids, they don't figure it out. And I suspect in a lot of the AHC kids, they don't figure it out quite as well. Right? So, and that's because there's superimposed dyspraxia, the, the learning disability for movement, on top of the abnormal movement, right? And it's going to vary. Some kids are going to be better or worse at figuring out how to compensate for their own movement. He's quite good at it. But what I want to show here in these individual frames is look at that posture of the right leg, right? Same posture over and over and over again throughout this, right? So there's the single inserted posture, which is happening over and over and over again. And that may actually be what's happening. We see this very complex movement that the child makes. But ultimately, the reason he's doing that is compensation for the single fixed inserted posture. Right. We can see this over and over in other di disorders. This child has a genetic disease called pantothenate kinase degeneration. Um, and and uh, I'm just showing his, he's just making these hand grip movements where he's opening and closing his hand like this. Um, but what you see is on different hand grip movements, he goes through the same intermediate posture with two fingers flexed and, and two fingers extended. That's an intermediate posture. I didn't ask him to do that. He just keeps going through that posture, right? So it's an, again, it's a, it's a superimposed posture in the middle of the movement. There's other things that's important to recognize about him. Um, he's moving slowly, right? And that slow movement, which we call bradykinesia, commonly seen in Parkinson's disease, also is very commonly seen in dystonia. And, and I, don't, I don't know enough about the AHC kids to know how much bradykinesia there is. It does seem as if there's some. There's two components to bradykinesia. There's slow movement and there's delayed initiation of movement. And, and I suspect that in, in some of your kids, we see a, little, a mixture of both of those. Um, this is another child with dystonia. This, uh, um, this, is slightly slow, this is a slow motion video. So, uh, um, but again, you see the same thing. If you look at the posture of his hand over and over again, you get this flexed wrist, extended, finger posture, right? It was actually somewhat hard to do. Um, and, and this is, uh, that's, that's a common posture scene, and that shows up over and over and over. And these things. So again, these superimposed postures. So that led me to ask the question, okay, where do these postures come from? What, on what do we know uh, about the brain? You know, where in the brain do postures come from, right? And there was some very nice work done by a guy named Mike Graziano, um, which, where, where he would uh, uh, take an electrode and put it into a, a monkey cortex. And the way we originally figured out how different parts of the brain uh, you know, control different parts of your body, a guy named Penfield uh, would put electrodes in into different parts of the brain and turn them on. But he'd turn them on for like 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. It says, no matter where you are, I can get you here, right? It sort of navigates your body to that final position. So it suggests 
that the representation in the brain when you stimulate in different places is about this representation of specific postures, right? Um, and this is, this is very important. Mike thinks that this is a component of normal movement, but it also suggests what might happen if you abnormally activated these areas of brain, which essentially is what Mike is doing. From the monkey's point of view, it didn't have a choice about moving to that posture, right? So the monkey just has a dystonic posture from its point of view, right? Because it now, it now has a superimposed posture that it can't get out of, right? So what I think is happening is if you think about the brain, there are a number of things that could be happening. You could be having, you know, I want, to act, I want to activate this part of the brain, but that part is being turned on all by itself all the time, so I have one movement superimposed on another. Or it could just be too much spread, right? I want to activate this area, and it's just too big. I can't focus it. And I don't know which one of those it is. I think it's probably more likely this, that there are very specific things superimposed on that, right? And, and this is what it looks like on the outside of the brain and sort of the motor cortex area, right? But the motor cortex is the last stage in, in control before the signals leave the brain. Right? So what happens is there's a lot of different areas, your cerebellum, your basal ganglia, your thalamus, frontal cortex, all of these areas, all the things that are doing the thinking decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And then it sends that information to your motor cortex, which then sends the information down to the spinal cord. So, this, so I think this is happening at the, at the last stage right before movement, and that's, that's where Mike was stimulating, right? It was in motor cortex. The, you can show this one level before that in an area called premotor cortex. Um, you can get similar phenomena. Um, so what I'm, so the hypothesis here is that if that's where postures come from, then anything that turns on the postural mechanism can cause an abnormal posture, right? So dystonia could come from anywhere that projects into motor cortex, just so long as it's sort of banging on cortex too much and doesn't stop, right? And the reason this is important is because we had thought that dystonia comes from one area of the brain called the basal ganglia, and everything had focused on basal ganglia. And, and what had been surprising is when we start using medicines or surgeries that treat basal ganglia, only some of the children respond. And I think this is important because you recognize that in different children, different areas of the brain may be the cause of dystonia. And particularly in different diseases, different areas of the brain may be the cause of dystonia. And once you start thinking that way, it allows you to start asking this question more broadly. Okay, let's find out. Like, in this child, where is your dystonia coming from? And, and maybe there's other medicines that could be helpful for this, right? Um, so just to give examples, the most common, this is the child I showed you before, we believe that in DYT1 dystonia, in this genetic disease, it does come from the basal ganglia. And the reason for that is if we do deep brain stimulation, which I'll talk about in some detail in a minute, um, you can fix it. Right? And deep brain stimulation Um, but then we'd find a sensory from, from in, inside, um, uh, from all your body, and sends it up to the sensory areas. It's sort of a relay station. And it's, it's, and it's a little hard to see here, but he has a lesion right there in his thalamus, and he has dystonia in, in his hands from, from the sensory abnormality. And I show you that picture of the, uh, uh, of the mouse before that also had a sensory abnormality uh, leading to dystonia. Um, this is somebody with seizures in her frontal cortex. She's having a seizure right now, but look at the arm, right? The arm posture during the seizure. And uh, uh, to much that disease, which is the back of the brain and controls coordination, seems to also be a cause of dystonia. And that's why I was showing you before this issue about the, the fact that the kids with HC seem to have ataxia, 
ataxia comes from the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the part of your brain that's responsible for coordination, balance, gait, and, and control. It also controls tone in the muscles. It controls how stiff you are at baseline. People with cerebellar injury, particularly children, are very floppy and hypotonic. Right? And so you think about if you have a child who is kind of ataxic and floppy and hypotonic and also has dystonia, the most parsimonious explanation for where the dystonia would be coming from would be saying maybe it's coming from the cerebellum. Right? not from basal ganglia. I think this is going to become important in treatment. Now, the other thing that's interesting about the Graziano work is that, um, unfortunately for Mike, but fortunately for our understanding this, Mike thought that this was normal movement, and he's been very frustrated by the fact that you, can't, you can only generate certain movements. He had thought, okay, here we finally have the basis of all movement. If I just stimulate in the right part of the brain, I can generate any movement the monkey will make, and the answer is no doesn't seem to work that way, and probably because you need very complex patterns to generate arbitrary movements. But it does suggest that if you were to only stimulate in specific parts of the brain because you were causing dystonia, you would only get very specific movements. And surprisingly, that's what we see. We looked over, I had my uh, uh, physician assistant look at videos that I've taken from, I take videos of all my kids in clinics, so we see look over three years of videos to find all the dystonic postures made by different children with different diseases. And there's not that many of them. There's, in fact, almost all children with, and again, I can't speak for HC, but almost all children with other forms of dystonia, there's very, we can, there's like six different postures. Yes, there's a few others that people make, and every kid can have their own one, but almost all the kids make one of these six. Right? And, and the, there are these different ones. This is what she was calling the, the, the one, two, five posture, which is um, this, and you saw a little bit of that in the, in the kid who was doing the hand grips before. Thumb out. And, and second and fifth digit out. We see it over. These are all different over and over. Um, this that would this sort of the and back over and over in their kids as well. Um, here's, here's a bunch of other ones, inverse sort of swan necking of the fingers. Another fifth time to go through all you see it everywhere. So, um, so, so that's sort of my sense of, you know, what's, what's happening in dystonia, where is it coming from, how do we describe it? But now, what, how do you use that information to do something about it? So let's look at what the various treatments are. So the first thing for all of this, fix the cause, right? I mean, none of this would matter if we could treat AHC, right? You, so that, that's your first job, right? You, you want to figure out what the thing is. You want to replace the gene. You want to fix the channel. Okay, of course. That's not what I work on, but I'm hoping somebody else will, and all of this will become unnecessary. Until then, we have, we have to deal with the symptoms, right? And, and so uh, what do we have? We have medical and surgical treatments. I'm going to go briefly through some of the medicines here, um, partly because uh, one of the families was asking me about this earlier this morning, and I realized that there may be a lot of confusion on some of this stuff. Um, and then I'm going to talk about deep brain stimulation, which has been probably the most effective thing in, in other cases of dystonia. Um, so um, one of the standard medicines for dystonia is trihexaphenidyl or artane. Um, one of the common errors that people make is that they underdose it. You need quite a lot of it. Teenagers typically need 50 to 60 milligrams a day or more. Um, younger kids could get away with a lot less. Um, it's more effective in younger children. You want to start artane early. Um, and, and by early, I mean as soon as you see symptoms. When you have kids with cerebral palsy who are developing dystonia under the age of a year of age, you want to start artane then. And then you, you can use low doses for short periods of time and make them better. Uh, the longer you wait, the, the less well this stuff works. Um, and, but you do need to, in the teenagers particularly, you need to go to very high doses. And, and they will get side effects. They're usually minor. They're usually reversible. They usually adapt, you can usually adapt to them. Um, but, uh, but, they, but they may happen. Um, and the rule, of course, is with all medicines, you go up slow and you come down slow. The other thing I point out to people, um, you don't have dystonia. It doesn't happen when you sleep, so there's no point in taking the medicine at bedtime, right? It's morning, noon, early afternoon. That's when you take these things. You don't care when they're asleep, right, because they don't have dystonia because sleep shuts the whole thing down, right? Same rule, Cinemet. I don't know if this works in AHC. Um, it works in a subset of kids with other diseases. Surprisingly, Cinemet, levodopa, dopamine, affects the basal ganglia. There are children with alternating hemi, not alternating, with, with ataxia telangiectasia who respond to dopamine. I do not know why, because that disease does not affect basal ganglia. So 
the point is, even when you don't know why, we usually try this. Children with, with uh, cerebral palsy surprisingly do respond to this. Um, about a subset of them, it's probably about 30% of them. Um, the, the common errors that people see are with Cinemet. There's two forms of the tablets. There's 110s and 125s. You have to use the 125s. Um, the, it's a combination of two medicines. The lipodopa is 100 milligrams. Or there's something called carbidopa, which is the 25 milligrams. The 25 milligram stuff, um, the carbidopa is there to protect your stomach and to get the stuff into your brain. There's no reason not to use as much of it as you can. And in fact, if you're getting a lot of nausea, you can give extra of the carbidopa. Usually only have to do that for a couple days. It's a bitch. Sugar increases absorption, will increase side effects and increase efficacy. Um, and what you really want to do is take it on empty stomach so you don't have to worry about whether your food is controlling it or not. Benzodiazepines uh, work for large numbers of movement disorders, including AHC. Um, you want to decide if you're using the benzodiazepines as chronic treatment or as rescue treatment. You know, these, these are the four that are commonly used. Uh, of these, my experience has been Ativan or lorazepam is the least effective for movement disorders. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just not as good. Diazepam probably is the, is the most effective for movement disorders. Uh, benzodiazepines affect GABA, which is the inhibitory system in the brain. There's two classes of GABA receptors, GABA A and GABA B. Probably both are important. Uh, diazepam has, has uh, affect both of them very nicely. Midazolam, not so much. Lorazepam is pretty much a pure GABA A agonist. Um, and uh, clonazepam is, is also a mix. So the issue with thinking about the speed of activation, fast, amidazolam is fast acting short duration and is typically used intravenously in hospitals when we need to use this for an anesthetic. Clonazepam is long acting. This can be, if you want to take something every day for years to prevent spells, it should be this, right? Because this thing, because it's long acting, you don't get as sedated with it. And you don't have as many side effects. Um, diazepam is a mix. And then one of the things that's important to recognize is it's available as rectal diastat, which is used to treat seizures. Uh, I would be somewhat careful because it works primarily on sodium channels. And again, we're dealing with a disease that affects sodium channels. So you need to be a little bit careful about that. Um, baclofen is a GABA B agonist. So it's, it's the other half of the benzodiazepines. Does seem to be effective in dystonia partially. It's an antispasticity medicine, but it is useful. It can be done as an intrathecal baclofen pump, which gives very high doses. Um, but you would not want to use that for an intermittent disease. The pumps can't be turned, you can't go up and down rapidly on the pumps. Um, but you could use it as a background treatment. Um, I tend to not use it. It has lots of complications. If the pumps fail, it's a life-threatening experience, and so you have to be careful about these things. Um, but uh, in, in cases when we've had nothing else, you can use it as a generalized high-power muscle relaxant when pumped in. Um, taken orally, it's a, it's a reasonably good muscle relaxant and reasonably safe. And Botox. Um, don't forget Botox, even for intermittent things. So Botox, people think that Botox works by weakening muscles. That is not true. It can weaken muscles. But I think the reason Botox works in spasticity and in dystonia is because it reduces reflexes. One of the things that uh, some of you may be aware of is that there are uh, every muscle in your body actually contains two different types of muscle fibers, what we call intrinsic and extrinsic. There, there is the, the extrinsic ones are the ones that generate all the force. The intrinsic ones are there to measure the length of the muscle. 
So every muscle knows how long it is. It's got stretch receptors in it. Those intrinsic fibers are responsible for tuning the stretch receptors, right? But they're just like any other muscle fiber. So if the Botox were to, were to partially uh, paralyze the intrinsic fibers, you are reducing your stretch response from the muscle and reducing the stretch reflex. That's how I think it works. Because successful treatment with Botox does not weaken the muscle, but does reduce the reflexes. Right? And I think it does that. I have no idea what it would do in this disorder. Um, and, and so I, I, can't, I can neither recommend it nor not recommend it, but it's one of those things that at some point, somebody, maybe me, is going to try. Um, the, uh, uh, what deep brain stimulation is a surgical treatment for many different things, but I use it for dystonia. Um, it is uh, uh, probably more effective than any medicine that we have, but that doesn't mean it's great. So I showed you the case before of the child who was essentially cured by this. That is only true for that category of dystonia. If you have what we call secondary dystonia, dystonia caused by something else, the effect of deep brain stimulation is not that great. About 70% of the kids get about 20% benefit, right? And that's hard because you're doing elective brain surgery for a 70% chance of 20% benefit, right? But that's better than anything else we've got. So a lot of kids will do it, particularly when we're in desperate situations. And um, unlike back open pumps, failures are not life-threatening. You can always take the thing out um, so that uh, um, it, although it's brain surgery, in the scheme of brain surgery, maybe it's less hard than other brain surgeries. I don't know. Um, the way it works is you have wires inside your brain. They connect. They run under the skin to a pacemaker in your chest. The pacemaker is standard pacemaker technology, but we can program it from the outside and change things. Um, it is commonly used in Parkinson's disease. All other uses are off-label. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it matters. This is CME. I guess I'm supposed to say everything I'm talking about is off-label. Everything in children is off-label. Right? Um, <laughs> so it's, um, you know, there are a couple of different targets. Here's the anatomy. We, right, we have the, the, the basal ganglia, primarily the globus pallidus, and this thing called the subthalamic nucleus here. This is a slice of the brain looking this way. Um, here's the thalamus in the middle. Right? And, and uh, um, so these are the usual targets. We go, either go for thalamus or, in, or into globus pallidus. They're different targets for different diseases. In Parkinson's disease, we, seem, we, we have had the best success with that subthalamic nucleus, which is sort of, here's the thalamus, here's below the thalamus, hence subthalamic, right? Um, and, but also, Parkinsonism will respond to uh, um, what's in the globus pallidus, this region here, uh, in, which is part of the basal ganglia. Um, for tremor in adults, so there's a disease called essential tremor, which occurs in adults, very rarely in children, we, we go into a nucleus in the thalamus here called the VIM nucleus. The VIM, ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus, ventral sort of at the bottom between the others, is what that means. Um, VIM is important because it's where the cerebellum comes through. So the cerebellum, you can see sort of vaguely here, is at the back of the brain, right? The cerebellum sends all its signals up to the rest of the brain through the VIM nucleus. When we call this stimulation, but it's probably actually blocking things. It's probably jamming the signals in there because we, we put the wires in and we, we run them at very high frequencies. It's preventing things from going through. So what we're probably doing here is we're blocking the cerebellum's ability to send the tremor signal up to the motor cortex, right? This is important because I think if it's sending a different kind of signal, if instead of sending a tremor signal, it's sending a constant signal to the cortex, you probably end up with...
MRI and then we draw these lines on it, figure out where the target goes, and there's, a very, there's this thing called stereotactic surgery, which makes sure that you get the wires into the right place. It's a very complicated planning process to get the wires in the right place. It's a very easy surgery, right? The, the skull is not opened. You, well, drill holes in it, but, you know, and the wires go down through it, right? It's very different than taking out tumors and sort of fishing around. So I showed you this kid before. The reason we spend so much time looking at this disease, at, at this intervention, is because it has the ability to do this, right? Um, now, again, different disease, but it does say that if you're going to put your eggs in a basket, this might be a reasonable basket to be using, right? That there, there's some, there's something about this, right? And as I say to the surgeons, you know, they they can put a wire anywhere in the brain I ask them to, and so the question is just to find out the right spot. And we really do have a lot of control if you can get into the right spot, but the brain's a big place, and and uh, uh, you got to get the right spot. Um, no, this is not an episodic disease. This, in him, it will happen any time he tries to move. So he, when he's sitting or lying down, he'll look normal. But as soon as he tries to move, it happens. But it's not, this is not episodic uh, the way AHC is, that particular disease. No. Um, this, this is a girl with, uh, actually, she also has primary dystonia. This is what she was like all day. This is a month after the DBS. Um, and uh, um, and this is, this is uh, a year and three months after the DBS. Not a cure, right? But certainly a lot better, right? So, so the point, this is more typical of, of some of the kids that with, with other diseases. And this is very typical of a child with cerebral palsy. Um, and, and in his case, uh, let's say I don't have longer follow-up. This is just a video one month. What you, the excess movements, we were able to calm down. But he still can't walk very well. He can walk. He could walk before. He can walk after. But he's not walking much better. So the point is that the, and I'm just trying to give a sense of what, what are the reasonable expectations in some of these diseases. And the problem, and the reason I want to do research in this is because I, I, I feel like if I can put a wire anywhere in this child's brain, I should be able to do better than this. Yes, this is good. Yes, he's happy we did it. Yes, when the batteries fail, he wants me to replace them. But it's, but still, I, I think we should be able to do better than this, right? So I think there's a lot of role for research, and I'm spending a lot of time looking at this. One of the ways I'm doing this, and there's a patient in hospital as we speak with this, um, is that the way that, that deep brain stimulation is typically done is we say, okay, we think it's dystonia, we think basal ganglia are where the dystonia comes from, so let's put wires in a basal ganglia, right? And I'm saying, I don't know any of that in these kids. I think every kid is different. We'd better find out how we're going to figure it out. So now we're using test wires. This child uh, that was this about a month ago, um, we put 10 different wires under her head. These are test wires. Um, for people, uh, probably no one with AHC has done this, but for people who have bad epilepsy, we have these things called epilepsy monitoring units, and you need to figure out where the epilepsy is coming from because you're going to remove that part of the brain. And so what you do is you put wires into the brain where you think many, many wires, often 20 or 30 different wires into the brain. You keep them in there for a week. You let the kid have a bunch of seizures. You figure out where the, epile where the seizure is coming from by looking at all those wires, and sometimes you stimulate on the wires to try and cause seizures to figure out which are the sensitive areas of the brain, and then you go take them out. So, so now I'm using the same technology for the movement disorders. So we put 10 wires in the brain, five on each side, in different places, so subthalamic nucleus, uh, globus pallidus, and, and, and thalamus in this case, and listen for a week. Right? This child had very bad dystonia, and we just listened for a week and tried to figure out where, not we're, gonna, we're not going to take out parts of the brain, but where to put permanent electrodes. So these are temporary electrodes. And you see that sort of little ridging on it. Every, every little ridge is actually a contact. Those are all little, wire, little, little points at which I can measure, and I can stimulate. And we can see if it, if it made any difference. Um, and and you, can, you can measure all sorts of interesting things while all this is going on. These are what we, this is sort of what we call single spike data. So as you know, neurons work by firing spikes. So we can see spikes that happen. And one of the things that we found is in certain areas of the brain, there's these little arrows here every time this girl would have a spasm. Um, and every time she had a spasm, there were spikes that came from this area of the brain and from this area, but not from these areas and not from there, right? So you can see different areas of the brain responding to her spasms, right? That doesn't mean that these are the cause of the spasms, right? It could be a result of the spasms. But it does mean that these areas where it's silent aren't doing anything. They're neither a cause nor a result, right? So we can sort of X them off our list, right? Um, and that, that's been very helpful. We can also look at other activity. Um, so this is, this is over a long period of time. This is, I think, about a four or five hour period looking at different spasms and looking what those, what those areas do. And then we can do what we call evoke potentials, which is where I can uh, stimulate. In this case, we're stimulating at uh, uh, electrical stimulation of the wrist, as a standard clinical practice would be called an EMG or a nerve conduction study. But you can stimulate here, and you can watch the signals go in, 
and you can see where they go and you can make sure that everything's hooked up properly to make sure that you're in the right area of the brain. You can also stimulate inside the brain and see how those signals get to other areas of the brain. What's hooked up to what? Right? Now, we don't know normal because I'm not allowed to do this in healthy children, right? <laughs> so, you know, no healthy child is going to let anybody put 10 wires into their brain, so I don't have that comparison. But what I can compare is the kids who have dystonia, dystonia only happens sometimes, right? In, in AHC, it's going to be during episodes. In other cases, it's going to be triggered by voluntary movement. So you can compare what does that child look like when they're having their dystonia versus what does that child look like when they're not having dystonia, right? This is an example of when we stimulate on, on uh, uh, let's see which side was which. It's probably the, the right side here. We, we, uh, when we stimulate on the right side, we see a response in some areas of the brain that's bigger than in other areas of the brain, but only on the right side and not on the left side. Um, and, uh, uh, and that response is at about 12 to 15 milliseconds, which is the amount of time it takes a signal to get from your wrist up into your brain. Right? So, so we can we can measure these things, and we can measure them in in a child, right? This is these are the kinds of experiments that are typically done in in uh, in monkeys, right? Um, because we're and the point is you can do things in healthy monkeys because uh, we we're willing to do experimentation on animals. The the in children, you can only do things like this if it has direct benefit for the child, and in this case it did, um, because what we're able to do then is use that information to try and decide in her uh, where, where her uh, dystonia was coming from. So for instance, this is this child while she was in the hospital. This is what one of her spasms looks like when she has them, and she was doing these things about every 15, 20 minutes. Um, and, and when I could turn the stimulation on, in this case it's in VIM. This is in the cerebellar projection nucleus, right? Um, in VIM, and I could just stop the spasms, and she just becomes calm. Now, she has contractors, um, so she's not going to return to completely normal posture, but she's completely relaxed and comfortable here, right? And I could literally turn it on and off. Right? It's just like, you know, and, and she would go into a spasm as soon as we stopped the, uh, uh, as soon as we stopped the stimulation. So it was, it was, quite, it was quite a powerful effect. Um, and in fact, what we did subsequently then is two weeks later, we, we took all these wires, all the temporary wires out two weeks later, implanted wires into VIM. Actually, we also put them in GPI. So we put them in the standard location plus this location. So she has four wires in her head now. And we've been programming her over the last month. And she's doing a lot better. We haven't completely stopped them, but we're certainly a lot better. So the point is that we, and, and we would not have known this, right, without checking her specifically. Um, now, and then, so the reason that I'm, I'm saying this is because um, I don't know. So, so there's a couple things that are, that are relevant for AHC. First of all is just recognizing the origins of dystonia and the possible treatments for it. I don't know if deep brain stimulation is a useful thing for, for AHC or not. Um, I was approached by, uh, like I said, by the ataxia telangiectasia people about doing deep brain stimulation. I was approached by them many years ago about trying that in some of the kids. And many, what they have, many of the kids in AT, as they get older, have these very bad headward head thrusting, backward myoclonic head thrusting episodes that are very, very disabling and, and quite painful. And they said, you know, would you do DBS for this? And I said, no, I have no idea where to put that wire. I have no idea if it will work. Um, I don't think it's ethical to go in there. And those kids have very high risk of infection, and so we, we have to be very careful with them. Um, that equation has now changed, because if I can go in and I can actually do testing, and I can say, let me figure it out. Let me listen to where that's coming from. Let me try this in all of these locations beforehand and see if it works for your child. And if it doesn't, we take all the, all the electrodes out. You go home, no harm, no foul, right? But if I could do that and find something, now I'm a lot more confident. Now I don't feel like I'm kind of flying blind and, and sort of shooting in the dark here and hoping I hit the right part of the brain, right? I, I, suddenly, um, I can actually do this in, in a way that I think is more reasoned. That changes the, the thinking, right? And that's the same kind of thinking that I would say for AHC, which is I have no idea where in the brain, if, if any, deep brain stimulation would help. I don't know if it would work in the brain. But it does raise the possibility that we could try it, right? And I'm, I'm not suggesting this, you know, for, for anybody's child at this point. I would need to, you know, again, this is a situation we have to look at a particular child, their particular symptoms. You'd have to prove that no medicine was helping. You'd have to say that no medicine was helping adequately. But if you'd run out of all other options and you're trying to say, okay, could this work, I think there's now a possible way to find out the answer to that. And that's, that's one of the things that, that uh, I'm hoping this will lead to. This technology using these epilepsy monitoring units is not, we're not using anything that isn't standard technology for children. Um, this is, it's just being used for movement disorders instead of for epilepsy. Um, but the surgeons are like, oh yeah, we do this all the time. So uh, um, again, and just coming down to sort of, su to, to summarize what I've been talking about, you know, this is, if this is your muscle down here, your muscle has sensory receptors which go up to your spinal cord, 
some of those go through the, the regular stretch reflex back to your motor neuron back to muscle. That's the knee jerk reflex, right? What we call the short latency stretch reflex, right? But also some of those signals go up to the sensory areas of your brain, go across to the motor areas of your brain and come down. That's called the long latency stretch reflex, right? And that goes all the way up and goes down. So I think this one is the spasticity problem and this one is the dystonia problem. And I think anything that, that bangs on your motor cortex there will turn on postures and will increase these reflexes. And I, I think that's what I've been studying this at, at uh, some detail for quite a while. Cerebellum, basal ganglia, prefrontal cortex, thalamus. I think there's lots of, lots of potential areas. And I think the key then is just to figure out where they're coming from in one particular child. I think it's different in different diseases. And in some diseases, it may di be different in different children, even in the same disease, like cerebral palsy, which is an acquired injury due to lack of oxygen. Different children have different injuries, so the same disease may have different locations. That's unlikely to be the case in something like AHC. Probably, if one child with AHC has dystonia from one part of the brain, so do they all. I don't know that for sure, but it's much more likely in a genetic disease that there'll be some homogeneity of, of, of cause. Um, so uh, anyway, the conclusion is that we're starting to get some, um, uh, some greater understanding of the nature of these movement disorders. Uh, this is, I'm just showing him, he's uh, 16, this is the first time he's ever walked in his life. Um, then this was two years after deep brain stimulation. He has cerebral palsy. But the point is that you can, you know, it never became normal, um, and his walking has never been stable, but at least he was able to learn to walk, right? So, um, and this, again, he had, this is, a, this was acquired at birth, so it was a very, again, a very different situation than what you're looking at. I think there's specific questions in AHC, right? We still don't, you know, how, missing the P, sorry. Um, how, how, do the, uh, uh, how do these mutations cause dystonia? What's the link, right? And, and why is it dystonia? And it may just be, you know, certain areas of the brain, the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, um, some of the, the, the uh, medium spiny neurons in the, in the striatum um, of the basal ganglia, um, some of the neurons in motor cortex are big neurons that use a lot of energy, and they are the sentinel pigeons of the brain. Anything that goes wrong, those are the, one, those are the first ones to die. Uh, and so it may just be that. It may just be you've got a metabolic stress on a bunch of neurons, and the first ones to get hit are these, and that's why we see this stuff over and over again. I don't know. Or it could be that there's something very specific about the link between ATP1, ATP3, and certain subtypes of cells. Um, so um, what, what is the anatomic source? Is the same for each child, and really underlying with the cerebellum is it needs to be investigated for this stuff. I don't know that that's the case, but I just want I want to emphasize that because there's this growing understanding between uh, me and, and, and some other researchers in this area that, that dystonia is not just a basal ganglia disease. How do we treat dystonia when it's only intermittent? This is very th this is an unusual disorder for that, right? That that so the specific challenge that you guys have is clinically, how do you treat? We're used to treating dystonia as an everyday problem. We're not used to treating dystonia when it comes on only sometimes. And so you have to be careful that if you don't have the thing every day, the thing that treats the dystonia doesn't make you worse when you don't have the dystonia, right? So it just becomes more of a balancing act in terms of clinical treatment. Um, and then, you know, there's both intermittent and progressive components, right? Many of the kids will end up with some degree of baseline dystonia um, that's going on over time. And is that the same thing as the dystonia that occurs during the episode? How does this interact with the ataxia? How does it interact with the myoclonus? How does it interact with the dyspraxia? All of these things are feeding together, and in individual children, we need to figure out where, what's the problem that's leading to the greatest disability and, and go for that. You know, at the end of the day, you want to cure the underlying disease, but in symptomatic treatment, you, what you're trying to do is figure out which symptoms cause, uh, are, are, are the cause of the disability, which symptoms are causing the functional problems and then try to go for those, those things first. Anyway, I, uh, you know, most of the work is done by a large number of people in my lab at USC, and I want to thank them. I want to thank all the research subjects and kids who come to the clinic and all of you guys. Thank you so much. Or behind time, so I don't know what you want to do for questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he wasn't always that way. About 12 years ago, he was in the hospital for a, a big episode, mm -hmm. and he came out with that. Yeah. Is that dystonia, that it's all the time? Yeah, probably. Okay. I mean, you know, dystonia is pretty easy to recognize, which is that 
you know, you can have your arm can be frozen because of the joint problem, but if you can move him when he's asleep, then you know it's not a joint problem, right? Um, and if it's frozen at a mid range, if it's not extended or completely flexed, it's too smart to be just your spinal cord, it's, right? It's right. Like this. If, it, if it's frozen halfway, it mm -hmm. has to be brain, and then it's dystonia by definition. So that okay. is dystonia. And, and again, if, if, if it's a, a single joint or a single muscle problem, I'd use Botox as my first line drug for that. Rather than sort of bathe the brain in things that have lots of side effects, let's just go specifically for those, particularly if it's every day. Okay. Right. So you may have already used Botox for that, yes. for those, yeah. All right. Thank you. Further. Um, just real quick, what are the risks involved with uh, putting wires in yeah, people's the brain? Simulation? Well, you know, it's surgery, right? And it's elective neurosurgery. You know? Again, um, we haven't. I haven't seen any deaths from this um, in in adults. This is commonly done Parkinson's disease, uh, which means that you're doing this in people with 70 and 80 year old brains. Um, they can get strokes. I've never seen the stroke in a child. Um, they they do seem they're they're or if they have small amounts of bleeding, it's tiny and it, it resolves right away. Um, but not as many children have been done worldwide. Um, probably at this point, 400 to 500 children have been implanted. Um, worldwide, there's probably tens of thousands of adults that have been implanted. The actual risk, uh, combined risk for the adults is under 3%. Um, so not zero, right? You, you would only do this, like say, the, the, you'll only do surgery if all medical management has failed, and you'll only do surgery if really, you know, the, the, the risks are uh, ex far exceeded by the benefits. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult decision for many families. Um, I was just, my daughter was just recently put on Cinemet as a rescue med. Does it work just part-time, like as a PRN to treat the dystonia and it sometimes helps with the um, hemiplasia? You know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I've never tried that in AHC. It could. Cinemet is very fast acting. Um, it will, uh, has onset, so in Parkinson's, for instance, it will start yeah. to work within about a half hour. Yeah. Um, and there, there's other things. There's, um, uh, um, to remember what there's an injectable form like uh, it's not alpha methyl dope, but there's there's a there's an injectable form that works even faster um, and people have these sort of quick release cinnamon tablets that have been available in Europe and stuff very fast acting if your child responds to it and responds short term absolutely I mean you don't want to be on something every day if you can just use it intermittently that would be much better um, I just have not I have not tried that so that's that's definitely we tried it as an infant and she had no response yeah. for the dystonia and then we just started it in December and it just seems to even take like 30 seconds off of 10 episodes a day we get an hour back. yeah so okay. it seems to be yeah it could be I mean you might also want to try it as a preventive right right you could do it as lower dose as a preventive and then add additional if she goes into a spasm as well it's very fast acting uh, no known side effects other than the nausea um, and uh, um, seems to be quite safe, right? Your body makes the stuff anyway. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we're not going to take a break, everybody. So if you have to go to the bathroom, get a cup. All right, a real, uh, real fun topic. So, <laughs> Rinda Hall is going to talk about managing relationships in a stressful lifestyle. So, if you have no stress in your life, you can leave the room. If you want to hang out and listen, you can listen. So, listen. We have uh, we all have uh, children with uh, with different need, you know different triggers. One of our one of the triggers for my son actually is perfume and cologne. So, if you guys have perfume or cologne on today, which you're not supposed to. Please stay away from Sean Gerber because he tries to hug everybody. Does that make sense? And then uh, if you get a chance to take a shower, go take a shower. So no friends. Not like a French whore. Go take a shower. Please. All right. Holding the woman.